The Night the Ghost Got In by James Grover Thurber On the night of November 17, 1915, there was a great commotion at our house. I should have ignored the walking sounds and gone to bed. But, unfortunately, I didn't do so. Because of that, my mother threw a shoe at our neighbor's window and my grandfather shot a policeman. I am sorry. I should have not done anything on hearing the sounds of the footsteps. The entire scene started when it was quarter past one o'clock in the morning. I heard a rhythmic rise and fall of footsteps around the dining room table. My mother was sleeping in her room upstairs and my brother Herman in his room. My grandfather was asleep in the attic in his old walnut bed which once fell on my father. I had just stepped out of the bathtub and was rubbing myself with the towel when I heard the steps. It was the sound of a man walking quickly around the dining table downstairs. The steps kept going round and round the table. At first I thought it was my father and my brother Roy who had gone to Indianapolis had returned. Then, I thought that there were some burglars. But, finally I came to a conclusion that it was a ghost. After the sounds stopped, I tiptoed to Herman's room. I woke him up in the dark shaking him. Up he responded in a tired hunting dog's tone. He was always under the fear that something would grab him at night. So, I made him understand that it was me. I alerted him saying, there is something downstairs. He got up and followed me till the staircase. Now, the walking sound had stopped. Herman looked at me with fear. I had only the bath towel around my waist. Herman turned away and tried to go back to sleep. I gripped his arm. When I was telling him that there was something downstairs, the steps began again. It circled the dining room table like a man running, and started up the stairs towards us, heavily, two at a time. But nothing came. Only the steps could be heard. Herman rushed to his room and slammed the door. I too shut the door immediately at the stairs top and held my knee against it. After a long minute, I slowly opened it. Nothing was there. We didn't hear any sound after that. The slamming of the doors had aroused mother. She peered out of her room. What on earth are you boys doing? She demanded. Herman came out of his room and said nothing in a low, unfriendly voice. But he was in color a light green. What was all that running around downstairs? Said mother. So she had heard the steps, too. We just looked at her. Burglars. She shouted, intuitively. I tired to quieten her by moving slowly towards the stairs. While advancing, I called, come on Herman. But, he backed off saying that, I will stay with mother. She's all excited. Instantly, I stepped back. Both of you, don't move a step. We will call the police. The phone was downstairs. I didn't know how we were going to call the police and I also didn't want the police. But mother in a gif opened the window of her bedroom. That window faced the bedroom window of a neighbor. My mother picked up a shoe and whammed it through a pane of glass across the narrow space that separated the two houses. Glass tinkled into the bedroom of our neighbor, a retired engraver Mr. Dot Bodwell, and his wife. Mr. Dot Bodwell was not well for quite some years and he was prone to mild attacks. Almost everybody we knew or lived near had some kind of attacks. The time was about two o'clock of a moonless night. Clouds hung back and low. Bodwell was at the window in a minute. He was frothing a little and he was shaking his fist. Mrs. Bodwell ranted we'll sell the house and go back to Peoria. 
My mother shouted burglars from our window. Herman and I didn't dare to tell her that it was not burglars but ghosts. My mother was more afraid of ghosts than burglars. Bodwell at first thought that my mother was cautioning him about the burglars in his house. But later, he understood that the burglars were at our house and called the police for us over an extension phone by his bed. After he had disappeared from the window, my mother suddenly picked up another shoe and tried to throw it at Bodwell's window for the second time, even if there was no need of it. I stopped her from throwing the shoe. Later she told that she tried it again because it gave her immense thrill. The police arrived at our house in a short time. They came in a Ford sedan full of them and a patrol wagon with about eight in it and a few reporters. There were also two policemen on motorcycles. They banged at our front door. Open up we are men from headquarters. I wanted to go down and let them in. But, mother didn't allow me. You haven't a stitch on. She pointed out. She also cautioned me saying. You would catch your death. I wound the towel around me again. Finally the cops put their shoulders to our big heavy front door with its thick beveled glass and broke it in. I could hear a rending of wood and a splash of glass on the floor of the hall. The cops switched on their torches and searched the living room, dining room and the entire house. When they came up, they caught me standing in my towel at the top. A heavy policeman climbing up the steps questioned me, Who are you? I live here, I said. The officer in charge reported to my mother. No sign of nobody lady, he said. Must have got away. What were they like? He asked further. Two or three of them. Mother answered. The cop standing nearby commented, whooping and carrying on slamming door. Funny. All the windows and door was locked on the inside tight as a tick. At downstairs, we could hear the tromping of the other police. Police were all over the place. Doors were yanked open. Drawers were yanked open. Windows were shot up and pulled down. Furniture fell with dull thumbs. A half dozen policemen emerged out of the darkness of the front hallway upstairs. They began to ransack the floor, pulled beds away from walls, tore clothes off hooks in the closets, pulled suitcase and boxes off shelves. One of them found an old zither. Roy had won it in a pool tournament. Look here, Joe he said strumming it with a big paw. Joe examined it and asked me what is it? It is an old zither. Our guinea pig used to sleep on it I replied. It was in fact true. The guinea pig we had once as a pet had never slept anywhere other than on the zither. But I should not have told them this. Joe and the other cops stared at me for long. They put the zither back on the shelf. No sign of nothing said the cop who had first spoken to mother. The lady seems hysterical. They all nodded, but said nothing, but they just looked at me. At that moment, we heard a creaking in the attic. Grandfather was turning over the bed. What is that? Snapped Joe. Five or six cops sprang for the attic door before I could intervene or explain. I realized that it would be bad if they burst in on Grandfather unannounced, or even announced. Grandfather was going through a phase in which he believed that General Meade's men, under steady hammering by Stonewall Jackson, were beginning retreat and even desert. Before proceeding, you should know a little bit about the American Civil War and the two forces that fought with each other. American Civil War was fought mainly because of the difference of opinion prevailed between the people of northern and southern part of America. Majority of the northern part depended on industries and a majority of the southern part depended on agriculture. Agriculture depended on the African slaves. So, the northerners supported slavery while the southerners were for the abolishment of slavery. 
because of this difference of opinion and wants, some states got separated from the Union and formed a new Union of States called the Confederate States of America. The then President of USA, Abraham Lincoln of Republican Party, naturally had to tackle this and the attacks of the Confederates. Thus, the Civil War began. Now, coming back to our lesson, General Meade was under the Republican Party and Stonewall Jackson was with the Confederate forces. In the beginning Confederate forces had an upper hand. During that time many men from Meade's army had run away from the army fearing Confederates. Narrator's grandfather was under the mindset that he was still in the days of civil war. He mistook the policemen for deserters from Meade's army. I sprang up to the attic at once but things were pretty confused already. Grandfather had evidently jumped to the conclusion that the police were deserters from Meade's army, trying to hide in his attic. He bounded out of bed wearing a long flannel nightgown over long wooden pants. The cops must have realized at once that the indignant white-haired old man belonged to the house, but they had no chance to say so. Back to the lines you good arm lily-livered cattle. With that, he fetched the officer who found the zither a flat-handed smack alongside his head that sent him sprawling. The others beat a retreat, but not enough, Grandfather grabbed a zither's gun from its holster and let it fly. Before they could act, Grandfather pulled the trigger and the cop held his bleeding shoulder with his other hand cursing our Grandfather. Somehow, we all finally got downstairs again and locked the door against the old gentleman. He fired once or twice more in the darkness and then went back to bed. That was Grandfather, I explained to Joe, out of breath. He thinks you're a deserter, I will say he does, said Joe. The cops were reluctant to leave without getting their hands on somebody. A reporter, a thin-faced, wispy man, came to me. I had put on one of Mother's dress, not being able to find anything else. The reporter looked at me with mingled suspicion and interest. Just what the hell is the real lowdown here, but, he asked. I decided to be frank with him. We had ghosts, I said. He gazed at me a long time as if I were a slot machine into which he had, without results, dropped a coin. Then he walked away. The cops followed him, the one grandfather shot holding his now bandaged arm, cursing and blaspheming. I am going to get my gun back from the old bird, said the zither cop. Yeah, said Joe. I told them I would bring it to the station house the next day. What was the matter with that one policeman? Mother asked, after they had gone. Grandfather shot him, I said. What for? She demanded. I told her he was a deserter. Of all things. Said mother. He was such a nice looking young man. Grandfather was fresh as a daisy and full of jokes at breakfast next morning. We thought at first he had forgotten all about what had happened, but he hadn't. Over his third cup of coffee, he glared at Herman and me. What was the idea of all them cops tarry hooting round the house last night, he demanded. None of you bothered to leave a bottle of water beside my bed. Do you ever realize what it cost for a thirst man to look for water in the dining room last night? He had us there. 